So it is an honor to meet you. We are Keio University students studying medicine. I am Masayuki Sato, a fifth grade student. And I'm Juna Iwata, fourth grade student. We also work as a Keio University student ambassador, and we are very happy to be given an opportunity to interview Dr. Aviv Regev today. She is the head of genetic research and early development, but until recently was a professor of biology at MIT and Broad Institute. She is a 2020 KO Medical Prize laureate, which is given the outstanding and creative achievement of researchers in the field of medicine and life sciences by KO University. First of all, congratulations on winning the KO Medical Science Prize for single cell analysis technology to understanding the complexity of life. Thank you so much. So to begin with, how does the single cell RNA sequencing technology impact the field of medicine in your opinion? This is a, this is a great question. So our, our bodies are made of cells. It's the basic unit of life and disease happens in tissues that are made of many different kinds of cells. And um, the genes in our genome has a major impact on the types of abnormalities that we see in disease. And understanding those help us actually identify both new diagnosis for disease and then new treatments for disease. So all the cells in our body have, by and large, the same genome, um, but they use different parts of these instructions. And they do this through a process that is called gene expression where um, different genes get activated and they generate um, copies of themselves called RNA molecules, and those RNA molecules get translated into proteins, which are sort of the business end of the cell. So in order to understand the status of the cell, a healthy cell, a disease cell, you need to know the genes that the cell expresses. And there are techniques by which we can, we can do that by capturing the RNA and sequencing it and seeing the identity of those genes. The only problem we had in the past is that when we take a complex piece of tissue, it can have millions or tens of millions and billions, actually, of different cells. And these cells are not all the same. They can come from many different kinds of cells, and within them, they can be in all sorts of states. And what we did in the past is take, actually, this very complex uh, situation made of many different cells and put it through the lab equivalent of a, of a blender and get the lab equivalent of what you can think of as a, you know, a fruit smoothie if every piece of, um, every cell is the same as a piece of fruit. Mm -hmm. And so what single cell genomics allows us to do is to look at each of these cells separately and understand the genes that it activates and their unique patterns. Now you can do it in a healthy context where you look at a complex tissue like a piece of the gut or the brain or the skin and look at what it looks like under normal conditions. But in the same way, you can also apply it to disease tissues. So, for example, you can look at a tumor, or you can look, for example, at a piece of tissue from the lung of a deceased, um, of an individual who, who died in, because they succumbed to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And in this way, you can actually compare the cells that compose the tissue in health versus disease and see which genes they activate and use in each of these scenarios. And from these differences between them, we can tell things like what might be the processes that actually went wrong. Now, I remember one of you actually is interested both in pediatrics and in human genetics. This has a particular twist for what we call rare genetic diseases. Those diseases where a baby is born and unfortunately maybe two copies of an essential gene in the genome are not right. They have a variant in them that doesn't let the gene function normally. Today, we have wonderful human genetics techniques to actually identify those genes and as a result, associate them with a the disease and say, this gene causes the disease. But in order to actually try and develop therapies for that, we need to know the cells in which the gene acts because that gene is present in every cell in the body, but only some of the cells in the body actually use that gene. And for those cells, we, those are the ones to which we need to target therapies. And so in a disease like cystic fibrosis, one of the first diseases that was mapped by modern human genetics, we know the gene, it is called CFTR. But actually only in, 20, in 2018, a couple of years ago, um, after the advances of single cell genomics, we actually found the right cell type in which that gene is expressed in the lung and the airways. It was a cell type we didn't even know existed. Now that we know, one can devise therapies like cell therapies that actually target those specific cells and try to fix them in patients. Thank you. Um, it's, how to say, you mainly talk about the feature of each cell. 
like you regard each cell as an individual like us and you found uh, how they communicate each other, how they make a group, like tissue each other. And I think that is also that also happened in human society. I mean, I heard that you work with a lot of people, various persons from different specialties, not only medicine like us, but also science. So, um, but I also hear that there is a gap between people, how, how they think about things and the, the, how to say, in the way of thinking. So have you ever found any gap or differences or features between those two? I mean, specialist in medicine and specialist in science? I, that's a that's a great analogy and a great question. So so yes, in the same way that cells are specialized, so are humans. Cells are different from each other, mm. and each cell is kind of its own special snowflake, and they also change with time. And the same is also true for humans. We are each, of course, distinct from each other, but different people also have different traits or features that might be common to them. And what is also really important to remember, like cells, we are dynamic. We can change with time as well. And so one of the things that's really important in, in any endeavor, be it a tissue or scientific research, is this idea that you have not just division of labor, but also collaboration and cooperation. Mm -hmm. So there is specialization and different scientists are specialists in different areas, but they also have the ability to come together and do something where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I think that's really the story of single cell genomics. Mm -hmm. So in single cell genomics, several different things had to come to bear. One thing is technological advances in experimental biology. We had to come up with new lab techniques, not just one, but multiple iterations to get these methods to work, to work reliably, and to work on a really large scale. In developing these methods, we generated kinds of data that didn't exist before in biology. So we needed new algorithms in order to make sense of this data. These are data that are about you know, thousands and tens of thousands and now millions and tens of millions of cells in very high dimensional originally. You know, there's 20,000 genes in the human genome, so there's 20,000 dimensions and millions of points <laughs> in space. Humans don't reason about this directly, but they can write wonderful algorithms. They can develop algorithms and write great code that allows us to process it and bring out, actually, the patterns and signals that are in the data. And then, of course, we, this, all, all of these technological advances only make sense if we apply them to important biological questions. And so that brings in both biologists that are experts in particular systems and clinicians and physicians that are experts in how this relates to different types of diseases in different parts of the body. All of those individuals work together and it's actually an iterative and collaborative process. You can't exactly say where something ends. It's not linear, it's something end, it starts and ends, but rather it's a circle like that, a cycle where we kind of move things along. And when people come together, they change. And so they might start as somebody who say purely computational, has never worked in a wet lab, and maybe the last time they heard about, um, they heard about biology was in high school. Now all of a sudden, as a you know, well-seasoned computer scientist, they get posed with uh, new questions that come from biology and this type of rich data. And not only do they bring the things they already knew, but they learn new things and they change as a result of that. And they become more and more knowledgeable about biology. And in a similar way, biologists and clinicians learn to think in the terms of big data and complex computation. And often they come up with ideas to new analysis methods because they understand the problem really well, even though they might not know how to precisely develop the algorithm and write the code for it. And so this dynamic shift happens for people in all stages of their career, including for younger trainees, mm -hmm. as they've started their career making one particular set of choices, but they realize that they can learn a lot of other things mm -hmm. and bring them to bear on the questions that they're interested in. And I believe you, were, you have been uh, used to a diverse environment since you were a university student. I've heard at the Tel Aviv University in Israel, you were selected for a special course for gifted students that enables you to take uh, whatever lectures you like. So my question is, uh, could you tell me what you gained from the interdisciplinary program and also wasn't taking lectures from different fields, busy and hard? Yeah, so it's true. I actually went to a very unusual program at uh, Tel Aviv University. And one of, the, um, one of the things that was unique about this program is that you could take any class you wanted and you can do it um, 
at any um, at any at any point um, in your career, you didn't have to say fulfill the the prerequisites and so on. And I, I learned several really important um, I, I learned several very important things in in this um, in this way. The the first is that you learn your own uh, destiny. It, you own your own destiny. So um, rather than um, that, that, that rather than having somebody define what the curriculum is, what is an important problem to study, what it is that you want to do, you actually get to make that choice yourself. And um, I think that's a very important thing to learn early on um, as a scientist that you do not have to um, that you do not have to um, assume that somebody knows the answer of how to go after your uh, problem but rather that you can just take the take your problem and run with it and so you can define your own curriculum you can take your own classes it makes you it makes you i think uh, maybe more ambitious the second thing that i learned is that it's okay to be afraid but you can conquer your fear and so sometimes people refer to scientists as fearless i don't exactly use this term because i think we are actually afraid we're afraid of not knowing we're afraid of difficult problems being brave is not about being fearless. It is actually about conquering your fear and doing things despite being afraid. And I, I love this idea that you can take things very seriously and they can be very difficult and you know that they're difficult and yet you go after them as well. And then the third thing that I learned is the importance of rigor. So one of the principles in the program I went to is that when you wanted to study a particular subject, you actually had to study it at its maximum level. So, so you could just choose to study whatever you wanted. For example, you might be interested in math and in sociology. You would do math with the mathematicians. You wouldn't do a, a, a different version of math that was you know, tailored for biology or tailored for sociology. And you would do sociology with the sociologists. And as a result of that, you could understand things at their, at their more rigorous and, and purest level at which point it was easier for you to bring the disciplines together. And I've used this principle ever since in one of two ways. Sometimes I just had to assimilate myself into a new area and really appreciate it at that level of depth. And sometimes it's about knowing who is the right expert and finding the right collaborator or the right trainee to work with who would bring that rigor together with them. That's very interesting because um, Dr. Miyawaki also told me that uh, thinking outside of box and also knowing uh, various fields is very important to um, enjoy your research. So I, I think, yeah, I learned so many things from you. Um, and could you tell me um, what are you expecting to do next now for in the future? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I, I moved very recently, as you, as you said, I moved to head uh, genetic research and early development. I still have a lab and I will have a lab going forward because um, most of the scientists in genetic have their own lab. But what I really wanted to see happening in the next decade is take these kinds of um, revolutions that have actually happened both for biology and for computer science and use that simultaneously to both understand biology better and to impact human health directly by changing the way in which we develop medicines for patients. And so if you go back to um, the mid 70s, early 80s, which is when Genetic was founded in 1976, that was, the, the revolution at that time was molecular biology. Molecular biology was a brand new thing. And the idea was that it wasn't just a set of tools, great methods, you know, there were enzymes and could cut DNA in specific ways. That was, of course, a prerequisite for molecular biology, but it was a new way of thinking about biology, thinking about biology molecularly. And that revolutionized everything. It changed the fundamentals of how we understand biology. And at the same time, it changed the types of medicines that we develop for patients. And many of the drugs that we receive today are an outcome of molecular biology. I think the same applies to computational biology. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, it's a fantastic set of tools to, uh, together with methods like methods from gen everything from genomics to wearables really changes how we can measure and do things and analyze data in biology. But at the same time, it also brings a new perspective as to how we can actually think about biology mm -hmm. and about medicine and develop new medicines. And when you combine it together with the fact that with methods like single cell genomics, we can today really measure and study human biology rather than the biology of model organisms. And we can look at things at massive scale and great depth. And that we have 
a fantastic array of therapeutic modalities, everything you know from vaccines to small molecules to antibodies to cell therapies and so on, then it's, it's at this inflection point where you can imagine taking all of these things together and really changing both how we study biology and how we apply it um, to develop medicines in the context of disease. And so um, in, in, in this context, I, I feel that there's several big problems that we really want to understand, which is, um, honestly, we want to be able to speak um, the language of biology, the language of cells, how cells work alone, how they work with other cells in tissue. And for this, we need to do a lot of things. So we work on deciphering the genetic circuits in cells, and we're empowered by new math and new kinds of experiments that allow, you, uh, allow us to solve these big problems. And with this, we really want to see a roadmap emerge for diseases where we can understand where disease genes are in terms of cells and tissues, how they're organized in programs, how they relate to patient genotypes, to the patient um, disease states, reclassify the disease, and then couple the drug discovery process to develop the right kind of therapeutics um, in this area. And then finally, scientifically, there are so many opportunities. I mean, we very much look forward in the coming decade to complete the construction of the human cell atlas and also to extend the atlases across different human diseases. We're really excited about how, as I said, about how biology and computer science meet each other. There's all these big problems in biology that we used to think are too big, and now we realize that might not be too big. We can, we can somehow solve them with the right kind of computation and the right kind of data. And then uh, finally, as I said, human genetics and the Human Genome Project have given us this wonderful starting point into the genetic causes of disease, but now we re really need to take it all the way through and understand how the variants lead to function and dysfunction in the cells, in the tissues, in the organs, and in the patients. So I, I think it's going to be a very exciting decade. Thank you so much. So lastly, could you give a message to a young scientist? A message to young scientists? Um, I have two kinds of advice to young scientists. The first is what I call the non-advice advice. Non -advice. <laughs> we always, you know, the, el the elderly <laughs> always like giving advice. And also each of us always wants to ask for advice. But if I reflect back, I often, I often feel that sometimes the best decisions are, I made, the best leaps I've made, the things that honestly paid off the most were the things where maybe I was too ignorant to realize that I should ask someone for advice. So I didn't. I just kind of went ahead and did something because I was curious. I was interested. My heart told me that I should rather maybe than my mind. And I didn't ask for advice. And I suspect that had I asked for advice, I would have been told something that is the common wisdom. And it probably would have um, maybe steered me away from it, maybe have tempered my enthusiasm. So sometimes it's just good to go and not ask for advice. Mm -hmm. But that's a little bit of a cop out, of course. So I, I will give one piece of advice. I actually gave it recently <laughs> in a Mendel lecture, and I, I felt that it encapsulated well some things that I, I feel are important. Um, you should follow your heart and your moral compass. So you should do things that are good. Um, always go to the right place where you can carry out your mission and keep your mind flexible for new opportunities and ambitions. And I will add to this two very important things. Be generous and strive to do good in the world. Everything else will follow. That is a great encouraging known advice and <laughs> compassing advice. And thank you so much for sharing your experiences and thought with us today. Again, congratulations on your receipt of KO Medical Prize. And we are looking forward to the result of your future research. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and good luck to both of you in your career. Thank you so much. Thank you.